Hi, my name is Rachel White. I am a JFK assassination researcher. And in this video, I want to share with us uh, all about the backyard photos. So when I say the backyard photos, I'm trusting that we all know what I'm referring to. It's that iconic picture of Lee on his own that appeared in, uh, on the um, front cover of the uh, Time magazine, um, Time Life magazine, uh, around 1964 and he's there in the outside of the backyard uh, completely in black holding a rifle up here and a gun down here with what appears to be communist literature uh, kind of stuffed under his arm so uh, I'm trusting that we all really do understand what, what I'm saying so I just wanted to make that kind of uh, clear so that we can understand what we are talking about just for those who, who may not OK, so I'm not going to talk about the scientific analysis of these photos because that has been done um, and I am no expert in, in all of that side of things. What I'm interested in is how those photos have come about and the, the kind of history and timeline and provenance of those photos. So that is really what I'm going to be talking about in this video OK, so if you want to go and find out about the scientific analysis of of everything that's uh, that's been done with these photos, um, there's plenty of information on YouTube. Plenty of research has been done by people way more qualified than me to tell you the ins and outs of of how these photos were actually put together. OK, so right. Uh, the backyard photos, as we know, turned up at uh, Lee's interrogation on Saturday the 23rd when he's uh, being interrogated by the Dallas police. Um, the, this photo is, is put in front of Lee and he is presented with it. And his comment about the, this photo of himself was to say, this is a fake and I know photography really, really well. And in time, I'm going to prove that that photo, uh, these photos are, are fake. OK, so um, I'm going to take Lee Harvey Oswald at his word and, and agree with him that if he felt that they were fake, they are indeed fake. Now, it seems to, seems to be very clear to me that if you have posed for a photo, you kind of remember... Um, posing for that photo and knowing that you you made that stance and certainly if you're posing as a uh, kind of wannabe assassin uh, kind of renegade kind of gun running kind of person dressed in black I think you're going to remember posing for those po photos at, at a later date I, I just I have a feel that you, you would remember that so Liz is in this situation and we know for sure that if he had said that in front of his legal team, his legal represent, representative, um, they would have been taking that photo as evidence and picking it apart at that time to find out, is this photo a fake or not? But we know, don't we, that Lee had no legal assistance. No lawyer was sat next to him. And these things were presented in front of him as fake evidence. Do you remember in my one of my previous videos, I talked about how um, to build a case against someone, what you do is you pile in all the fake evidence and you build a case around that. So these backyard photos really are, in, in this scenario, the pinnacle of fake evidence. So I want to talk about how, how, how and why did that photo turn up in front of Lee, why did they use that photo uh, to actually frame him and, and to suggest that this is him in his uh, lone gunman uniform, as it were? Um, because that photo, after Lee had, had been murdered, went on to be sold to Time Life and they actually published it uh, on their front cover, as we know. Very, very famous, iconic photo. And that photo went really to tell the American people, here is your lone assassin. Here he is. Proof, proof, proof um, that this man is who he said, uh, who, who we're telling you he is. He's a lone assassin, the sole killer of JFK. And then the, the killer of, of Tippett later. So this, this photo absolutely at the time 
um, met its objective and did the job of convicting Lee in the public mind. So the, to explore this photo is a super important point and we must get to the bottom of it. OK, so um, we know, don't we, that um, the photograph itself, the photos themselves have come straight out of Ruth Payne's garage. On the Friday, after Lee has been arrested, the police go to Ruth Payne's house and they go for a little poke around, a little quick chat with Marina and Ruth. And they, at that point, they can't take any evidence or any, any ob items, objects out of the house whatsoever um, because they haven't got the right documentation, the right warrant in place. But of course, on the Saturday, back they come. They've got everything they need and they are taking everything that they feel that is of any importance, any any possessions maybe even Ruth and Michael's possessions and all sorts of things because they don't really know what's relevant or not so they're just taking all, all kinds of things out of Ruth Payne's house out of the garage and it is at this point when the backyard photos are discovered and they are taken obviously to the police department and that and later on in the afternoon they are presented in front of Lee so these photos have come straight out of Ruth Payne's house which is really interesting because um, what that is trying to say to us is this is Lee's possession. These photos are in Lee's possession. OK, um, but we have Lee in custody saying they're fake. They're, they're nothing to do with me. And I'm going to prove it to you why they're fake and how they're fake. So it's my feeling completely that those photographs have been planted in that garage. And it seems very, very likely to me that those photos had been pla placed in the garage quite deliberately. And they had been placed actually after the assassination. Now, what's what's really very um, interesting to me, if you remember in an earlier video, I talked about how Michael Payne, showed up at the Irving house, at Ruth's house, their house in Irving, uh, exactly at the moment the police were in that garage on the Friday afternoon. And uh, I believe that Michael spent time in that house. And in fact, Marguerite um, was um, staying that the, the night of the assassination, on the Friday night, in Ruth Payne's house, along with Marina and the babies. And clearly, she's given the sofa to sleep on. And she testifies that at two, three in the morning, something like that, she felt that Michael had walked past her and gone into the garage. And uh, I, I have no reason to doubt that that is a true testimony whatsoever. I mean, if we think about it, Marguerite is not going to be able to sleep very well. Who, who, which mother would? Your son is in custody. He has been, you know, uh, held up for, for the most awful crime of killing the president. Um, terrible, horrific. Um, you're going to be, as a mother, you're going to be going through all of the emotions. You're certainly not going to be able to sleep very well and certainly not on a sofa. And um, she's dozing. I believe she's dozing. And she's aware that Michael walks past her and goes out into that garage. And I honestly feel, and I believe Marguerite felt exactly the same, that that was the moment he was placing the, the photographs into the garage. I, I honestly do feel that. And if we think about that, that is absolutely um, logical. Because if those photographs had been in that house before the Friday, um, any at any point, um, Lee and Marina, Marina is living there, Lee is coming in and out, um, th they're going to be taking a huge risk of either Lee or Marina accidentally coming across those photos just in the normal course of living in a house. You're going to be opening drawers or rummaging through things and maybe looking for things or, or finding, looking through your own stuff. Lee certainly went in the garage the night before. So a huge, huge risk to find planted evidence before before it's needed. So it is my strong belief that Michael did in fact um, go in that garage in the middle of the night to place those photos deliberately. And I actually feel that he, he, he received those photos on the Friday lunchtime anyway. Now, uh, I'm, I'm always going to talk back about the things I've already talked about in other videos, so please do go back and, and check it out. But remember we talked about Howard Brennan, a witness who had said that there was a car 
parked outside the uh, school book depository at kind of a funny angle and it, it moved off momentarily after the assassination and how we discussed that was very possibly Michael who then went to his work at Fort Worth, made a phone call to Ruth and then came back to the garage and I honestly believe that at this point this is Michael and he is receiving a package of uh, photographs from Jack Ruby. We know that Jack Ruby was on the corner of Houston and Elm during the assassination time so so I, I honestly believe that um, Michael is at this point receiving these photographs specifically to place in that garage. That is what I believe. And I feel that uh, he went back to work to make an alibi. So it looks like the, he was he was always at work all morning. This is this is what it feels like to me. And um, I, I, I believe this is the case. So we need to think about how those photographs have come about. How did how did they get to Ruby? How did they get to Michael? Where did they where do they kind of come from? So it's very interesting actually that they there um, there was a a confession in the nineteen nineties from uh, a man called Ricky White, who is Roscoe White's uh, son. Now, they were clearing out some papers and some things, obviously having a huge family clear out, and they came across uh, Roscoe White's personal papers. Now, Roscoe died in around 1970, 71. So a good 20 years after the man's been dead, they're going through the stuff, and, and understandably, and out pops the composite um, parts of these backyard photos. And... What is a man uh, like Roscoe White doing with parts of, of the photos? Because remember, in 1963, it would be a literal cut and paste job. So what they find is a picture of the the background with the space for the figure kind of cut loose and cut, no, you know, space to, to be inserted in. So I, I don't really know how they would actually uh, uh, achieve it because, as I said, I'm not an expert, but I imagine that they've put... Uh, a figure into the picture and then re-photographed it and re-photographed it and that kind of thing. So uh, this is interesting how it's come out of Roscoe's personal paperwork along with some documentation about how he was going to be paid uh, for the things he did around the assassination. And we know full well that he was involved. He was involved, involved, involved. Uh, Roscoe was actually on the knoll as one of the shooters and he certainly uh, shot Tippett in the head. So Roscoe White is very, very much involved here and he's received in this in this personal paperwork, his son testifies that, the, that he's written about how much money he's going to receive for these, these tasks. So it's clear to see that Roscoe White is in, in a conspirator team here. And if we are looking at those photos and we were to look at them in an analytical kind of a way, we would see that the photo really, the photos really are of a man in a certain pose a body with a with Lee's head kind of added on. And when we look at comparison photos of Roscoe and the way in which Roscoe is standing, we can see that the stance of this body is very, very similar to a natural stance that Roscoe would take. So it looks likely that Roscoe actually took a picture of his own body and used that as the body part and then put uh, Lee's face into the picture and it's been obviously chopped and changed and and all kinds of things and uh the scientific experts are, will will be able to tell you about the, the difference in the shadows and the lengths and all of those things which I don't really understand but if you're interested in that go go check it out for sure because it, it is interesting so Roscoe is clearly involved in the construction of these photos and there is more than one of them there's three or four of these these photographs so they're clearly a series they're not just one snap. They're, they're clear, clearly a series and they're going to use the best kind of composite picture that comes out of these group of photos as the one or maybe more than one to just kind of plant. So it's very interesting. Now, somebody had to take a picture of that backyard because the backyard is actually Neely Street where Lee and Marina were living in the early part of 1963, before they moved into the house in uh, New Orleans, um, they in Magazine Street, uh, they lived in um, Neely Street, Dallas. Okay, 
And it's very interesting that um, when they move into the house in New Orleans, uh, Ruth Payne, certainly, and Michael were very involved in the move in and the move out of that address. So their association with the Paynes goes really quite far back. And um, experts will tell us that they place the actual picture of the backyard being taken on the 31st of March 1963. They looked at things like the foliage and and the things like that. Now, I actually did a little bit of research into the weather on the 31st of March 1963, and I can tell you from what I found out that it was cloudy and overcast. But uh, having read Michael's testimony... Uh, his testimony to the, the Shaw trial and to the HTSCA and to the Warren Commission, he actually admits that his, he actually went to Neely Street on the 2nd of April 1963. So this is what I feel is that it would be so easy for Michael to slip out into the yard and take just a blank picture of the Neely Street backyard or, or maybe a couple of pictures of the backyard ready for this photo to be put together and I really do believe that Michael is complicit in the beginnings of this uh, this scenario with these photos so I, I really wanted to kind of share share what I'm feeling with you and what kind of is unraveling here with these photos and and obviously if we're talking about um, the photos being um, constructed in nine in second of April 1963, really further back in the year. This tells us the plan in the works to set Lee up goes way back. It stretches way back. It was already in the works, completely in the works, right back then, before um, Lee and Marina go to New Orleans, before Lee is involved in the bioweapon secret project. Uh, there is a plan here to set Lee up by using these photos in, in some way. And um, it's very interesting we, to, to see how, how this has all kind of come about. And I would like to know who tasked Michael Payne with taking that picture in the first instance. And my suspicion is that it's uh, uh, Demora Shield. That's my suspicion, but we don't know for sure. So when, we, when I know for sure, I'm... No worries, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Now, the pictures themselves were taken with a camera called an Imperial Reflex camera. And basically, that camera is a bit of a cheapy article. And um, there was, in fact, that same model of camera found in uh, Lee's kind of sea duffel bags when they searched the pain garage. But it was broken and uh, it, that is strange in itself because it is a cheapy camera and Lee was really into photography. He, he was very, very, very good about, you know, doing, doing ph photography and worked at uh, Jagger's Charles Stovall and, you know, was into the understanding how f photographic equipment really was work working and, and all of those things. It's unlikely that he would have had a, a cheap camera and if it had been broken, he was the kind of man, I believe, to have just thrown it away. Um, I, I very much get the feeling that Lee was not attached to objects and, and things in his life, um, you know, sentimentally. And I feel that if he, if he knew that there was a broken camera, he would have just chucked it out. It's been through two house moves, uh, potentially, and it just seems very strange. So what I feel has happened here is that that also, that camera, has been planted into Lee's stuff. And it could have been done one of two ways. Um, it could have been done, uh, you know, by Michael at some point, stuff it in the top of the duffel bag. Um, but I suspect what's happened is that at some point, Michael has said to Lee, here you go, Lee, here's a camera. And Lee's not really bothered about this cheap, rubbishy camera. Um, and just uh, takes it and puts it in his bag himself. But, of course, in that way, it's got his fingerprints all over it. So he's been set up without even realising, hasn't he? So, so it could well have been uh, that kind of scenario. We, we don't really know. But I suspect if I had to have put money on it, that's what I would suspect has happened here. 
uh, with these with this uh, camera situation. So what I'm saying in in conclusion is that these photos are very important um, because this is this is really the key piece of evidence that has has been presented to the world in trying to convict Lee in the public mind of being a lone assassin um, and really it had at, at the time achieved its objective and I want to smash that down because we know Lee is not uh, an assassin in any way um, he's completely innocent of that and uh, so these photos now we can see that they're completely planted and they're, com they're completely being used to frame Lee up and I believe Michael Payne is complicit in the uh, progress of how these photographs have come into being. And um, that's that's really what I wanted to share with you, just so that we can kind of clear this kind of loose end up a little bit. So um, if you have any questions about any of the things I've shared, um, come and read our book Takedown, which is available as a free download on Amazon, or come and ask some questions at our Oswald's Not Shooter page, or even our new page called Take Takedown JFK Assassination Research, which is my page as well. So on Facebook, so we'd love to see you there, and um, please come uh, support our work. And uh, lovely to chat to you, and chat soon.